Ephesians chapter 4. If you would turn your Bibles there with me, Ephesians chapter 4. It's been fun working through Ephesians, and we're going to work through it again today. God has blessed us with this book, and I tell you, it has been tremendous. And today, when we come to verse 7, I think there's so much more to explore here that we're going to... I was planning in my original, uh, in your bullets, and you see verses 7 and 8, I believe. That's what I told Tawny. I lied. We're going to be in just verse 7 this morning. I didn't lie intentionally. But Verses 1 through 6, though, I want to review quickly as Paul has moved from the doctrine he teaches in chapters 1 and chapters 2 and chapters 3. And he continues to teach doctrine, but he gives instruction, and we know the instruction, I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy to which you have been called. Are you walking in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called? Well, we all fall short, and he calls us to humility, to gentleness, to patience, bearing with one another in love, right? Loving one another and putting up with each other. And sometimes that's the best we can do, right? But we do it in love, right? Maintaining the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Not creating unity. Christ does that. Jesus creates the unity, and we maintain it, right? We just seek not to mess it up. That's really what we do. The unity of the Spirit, truth, and light. And then he goes on. We talked about this last week. One body, one Spirit. One hope to which we are called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. The oneness that we have that God has given us in all of that is a little bit overwhelming, isn't it? Boy, we have a lot of oneness. And we come to verse 7 where Paul writes, but grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of of Christ's gift. The next few weeks we're going to be talking about spiritual gifts. And I want to challenge you as I've challenged you many times to be a Berean. You know what the Bereans were from the book of Acts? They went home and they studied the scriptures and said, let's make sure what I'm being taught is true. And I want you to continue to be a Berean. You shouldn't sit out there and say, I'm just going to drink in everything the pastor tells me and just trust him. No. I mean, I I like to be trustworthy, but I would prefer you trust the Holy Spirit and his word, okay? And, And don't give me implicit trust. And go home and study, because when we talk about spiritual gifts the next few weeks, I may say some things that you say that's contrary to maybe some of the things I've been taught or heard in the past, Well, don't just take my word for it. Go home and study the scriptures and say, is that, is pastor saying true, right? And confirm it in your own heart. Let the Holy Spirit enlighten you as you study God's word. Don't just take the enlightenment he's given to me and just take it as the gospel truth. Although I don't intend to deceive you, I don't intend to lie to you. And by the way, if you find something different, come talk to me because maybe I need correction, right? Is that possible? Yeah. My mom will tell you she's corrected me many times in my life. (laughs) <laughs> am I right? <laughs> yes, she has corrected me many times in my life. I could use correction at times too, but I, I just, as I have studied scripture myself more and more and more, what I have learned is I've been taught a lot of things that have just been handed down, but they didn't come out of God's word. <laughs> a, a lot of things, and I think we have seen this together at times, a lot of things we've been taught that were just, you know, almost tradition. Like we've had tradition handed down even in our conservative Baptist churches where tradition has ended up being what gets handed down instead of the truth of God's word. And let's be careful and let's make sure we stand on the truth of God's word. So my encouragement to you this morning is to be a Berean these next few weeks as we talk about spiritual gifts. When Paul opens up talking about this, he begins with that word but in most of your texts. Some of your texts might say now. But the word is an, it's an idea of con, um, conjoining Additional information. He's going to give you additional information to what he's already given you, but the word can often mean that the additional information is of a different nature, and we find that to be the case here. He's been talking about one, one body, one spirit, right? One Lord, one faith, one body, all this oneness, and then we see him use the word but in verse 7, but grace was given to each one of us. He goes from the one all that we share as one, and then he says, but to each one of us, each one of you, 
Grace was given. God gives grace to individuals. He did not save us as a conglomerate of a church. <laughs> he saved us each individually, didn't he? He came and met you and brought you the grace you needed at the moment that he saved you, right? And he continues, we'll talk today about how he continues to grace us after that initial time that he graces us, although he graced us before that, we just maybe didn't recognize that as his grace. But he meets us each individually. But the word grace there, it's not in your text, but there's a definite article in the Greek before that word. So you could say, but the grace, the grace was given to each one of us. God's grace, it's multifaceted, but it's one grace but he meets us each individually. And if we were to read further, which we won't this morning, we would find out that he is talking about gift, the grace that brings gifts to us and giftedness for the sake of the church. And by the way, each one of us has gifts from God that are given to us, not for you, but for everyone else. Isn't that awesome? But we're not here to talk about that so much this morning. We're going to talk about this morning about the foundation of these gifts, the grace, the grace. I am convinced that we are naturally so man-centered as people. It, it, it's just, it's the natural bent we have to think about what we do. Think about every religion in the world. It's about what you must do to make God happy, right? What you must do to please God, to manipulate God in a sense, so that he will give me what I want. If I can just make God happy enough, then God might just give me eternal life. That's why the rich young ruler says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Every other faith system outside of biblical Christianity is about what must we do. But biblical Christianity is totally different than that. And I would even argue sometimes mainstream Christianity gets this wrong. There can be a difference between mainstream Christianity and biblical Christianity. And by the way, mainstream Christianity can show up in a, in a lot of denominations. I'm, it can show up in Baptist churches too, Okay. When none of us are above this error. In fact, I would argue every one of us have committed this error in our own lives of not understanding the grace of God and of thinking of what must I do. Biblical Christianity, whoa. <laughs> Make sure the monitor's off if you would. I think I'm getting something up. All right. Biblical Christianity is about what God has done. It's not about what you do. It's about what God has done. And God does. And who God is. That's why I say we get so man-centered. When we need to be God-centered. We need to focus on God and who He is and what He does. And get our minds off of what we must do. But that's so hard. It's so hard to do that. We fall into that trap so easily. I mean, think of the last time someone asked you to share your testimony. It is very likely that you said something to the effect of, well, I received Jesus Christ when I was whatever years old or 10 years ago. Right? I mean, that's a common way to share how we were saved, right? I, I accepted Jesus Christ. I received Jesus Christ. I, I, I repented of my sins. I mean, there's a lot of things we say, but all of those describe your activity, don't they? I, and, and I'm guilty, by the way. It, it's not as though I can stand up here and say, I've never done that, no. And it doesn't make you not a Christian if you say it wrong, all right? That doesn't, doesn't do that. <laughs> But really, that's, that's completely turning what God has done upside down because we talk about what we've done, what we've done. 
And so I want us to talk about grace this morning. The grace that was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. I want us to talk about grace this morning and we're gonna do it from the book of Ephesians. Colin read Ephesians 1, 3 through 14. If you would turn back there with me. Let's look at what grace is and, and what God says about grace. Because we can't understand spiritual gifts if we don't understand the grace that is given to us that brings those spiritual gifts. Ephesians 1, starting in verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Notice that Paul says, Blessed be or speak well of our God, of the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Why do we speak well of God? Why do we praise God? Because he has blessed us, right? Blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Inherent to grace is giving. God is a giver. He is a giver. He gives. We always think of what we need to give to God. That's backwards. God gives to us. God gives to us. God's grace, he is a giver. He blesses us. Verse four, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Who's doing the action there? God is. He chose us in him, in Christ, before the foundation of the world. So before you existed, he chose you in Christ, before you existed, before he even created the world, what he created, what he chose us for, that we should be holy and blameless before him. He chose us to make us holy and blameless people. He chose us to make us that. Go on in verse five. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ. He, he gave you a destiny to make you his son or his daughter. He said, I am going to adopt that one. Who's doing the action? God is doing the action, amen. God is doing it. God predestines us for adoption. Why? According to the purpose of his will. It really, that's, that's a nice way of saying, because he wanted to. <laughs> because he wants to. That's why God does what he wants to do. And he wanted to adopt you if you are in Christ. He wanted to make you his son or daughter. Not because he saw you and said, oh, I think I could make something great out of that one. No, just because he wanted to. Not because he said, well, you will choose me. No, no. Not because of anything he saw in you. There's an old quartet song that said, what did he see in me? The answer to that question is nothing. He saw nothing in you. What he did is he saw his own character and he said, I love to be gracious. And that proves that when he goes on, when Paul goes on, according to the purpose of his will, verse uh, six, I think it is, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. To the praise of his glorious grace. Why did God do this? So that the world, in fact, so that the angels, so that the heavenly realms would praise him for his grace because he delights to make enemies his children. You were his enemy and he delights to take enemies and make them his kids and adopt them into his family. And it shows off his kindness, his goodness, his character. It shows off his grace. And you find in Ephesians chapter three, it shows it off to the heavenly realms. It shows it off to the angels, to the spiritual realms who see this and go, he's a gracious God that he saves wretches like these people. He is a gracious God. And that is why he saves for the praise of his own glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. Verse seven, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to what? The riches of his grace. You see it again? The riches of his grace. He is rich in grace. And in accordance with the riches of his grace, 
He redeems us. He forgives our sins. Whoo. Maybe it's been too long for you. That that doesn't stir you today. Maybe that happened so long ago that you don't remember what a wretched sinner you were. But if we could remember what a wretched sinner we were, we'd read that verse and we'd go, oh, <laughs> wow, that's grace. I didn't deserve that, right? And by the way, that rich grace, look at verse eight, which he lavished upon us. He poured it out on us and just keeps pouring it out on us until it's dripping off of us. He lavished his grace on us. In all wisdom and insight, he did this in a particular way through his son Jesus Christ with wisdom and insight to bring that grace to us. Verse nine, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose which he set forth in Christ making known to us the mystery of his will, creating us, putting us in the church. Verse 10, as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, Christ, things in heaven and things in earth, to bring us into the new creation one day in Christ, in his son, glorifying his son through what he does by bringing many sons to glory and daughters, by the way. I hate it when we just, they can't leave out the women, to daughters too, right? Sons and daughters of God. Verse 11, in him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to what? The praise of his glory. He saved you. He gave you a destiny of an inheritance. He gave that to you for his glory. That's why that song, what did he see in me? Nothing. He did it for himself. You say, that's selfish. Really? The grace you've received is selfish? <laughs> I mean, take the benefits. <laughs> right? I mean, lavishing you with grace, he gives to you grace because he likes to. He delights in it. And because it will give him glory. Verse 13, in him you also... When you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. He gave you the Holy Spirit, sealed you with the Holy Spirit, gave you a guarantee, because have you possessed glorification yet? No, we're still here. We haven't possessed it, but it is as good as possessed because I have the Holy Spirit sealed on me until that day. I can't lose it. I can't lose it. Because of, not because of me, but because of him. I can't lose the salvation. I can't get lost now that I've been found. Oh, so wonderful. Such wonderful truth. And why again to the praise of his glory? He did this for himself. And that's a wonderful truth because he doesn't change. If he did it for me, I change. If he did it because of me, I change. Don't you change? You're not the same person you were a year ago, five years ago, 10 years ago, are you? I mean, some of us have more gray hair and wrinkles or less hair, right? We're not the same people we were. We change. God does not change. So if he does it for his glory, that's another guarantee on top of the guarantee of the Holy Spirit that's in us that he will not deny because he cannot deny himself. We are so sealed in Christ. No risk. What grace is that? But sometimes I think we forget who we were. So we hear all these wonderful things and we think, yeah, he did that for me. That's good. And sometimes we even think, maybe I had it coming a little bit. So let's go to chapter two and let's look more at grace. What does he say about grace here? Well, let's start in verse one before he talks about the grace. 
And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. This was all of you. Every one of you were dead. And so was I. Every one of us. We walked according to our own passions. You say, uh, Pastor, I heard you, know, you were saved at five or six years old. How bad could it have been? I wanted my own way. And I did not care about God. I was his enemy. Doesn't matter. It was bad enough to cause me to be dead. We were wretches. We hated God. And some of you, I don't think I ever really hated God. Yes, you did. The Bible says you walked according to your own desires, your own fleshly desires, your own desires of your mind, lusting after your own way. I try to tell the Good News Club kids when I talk about sin, I said the reality is, is what sin is is not thinking what God thinks. It's, it's wanting anything that God does not want. It's, it's, it's not even acknowledging God. Like, like I could want something good, but if I don't acknowledge that's what God wants for me, I'm sinning. Even though it's something good. Because my desires are not his desires, they're my desires. And sometimes my desires are actually decent. But if I'm not thinking through what God desires, and I'm not acknowledging that I need that because God says I need that, I am in sin at that moment. When I describe sin that way, you think back on your week this week and think about how often you did not even contemplate in your decisions what God wanted. You just did it. How sinful were you this week? How sinful was I this week? How badly do I need his grace right now? I'm desperate even today, but praise God, he gives me grace all the time. And so now think about yourself before Christ because now you have a new mind that can cause you to think more about what God wants, right? Now you have a new mind, which there are times where we get it right, where we do think, what's God desire here before we move forward, right? Think about the times when you weren't thinking that and how long you lived there. You were dead. Did you need grace? Did you need grace? Were you hopeless? Were you helpless? Were you desperate? That's the picture Paul paints. And then we go to verse four. And I want you to know what Paul doesn't say. He does not say, then you. Then you then you receive Jesus Christ as your Savior. That's not what it says. It does not say, then you believe the gospel. It's not what it says. What's it say? And he's gonna emphasize this point. That's why I'm emphasizing. It says, but God. But God. Being rich in mercy. Because of the great love with which he loved us. And watch what he says in verse 5. Even when we were dead in our trespasses. And then what did he do? While you were still dead, what did he do? He made you alive together with Christ. He can't make you alive if you're alive. <laughs> you were dead. And God made you alive. You know, by the time you accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, by the time you believed, you had already been made alive because if you believed first, then you weren't dead. But the, the word of God is true. And by the time you believed, you were already made alive. No one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. You can't make that confession except by the Holy Spirit, truly. 
by the time you believed, by the time you professed, it was already done. Because he made you alive. Did Lazarus come out of the tomb, a dead man, and then God made him alive, then Jesus raised him from the dead then? Lazarus couldn't move. Lazarus couldn't hear until he was made alive. He couldn't even hear Jesus say, Lazarus, come forth, unless he was alive, right? He was made alive, and then he heard, Lazarus, come forth, and he got up, and he walked out. You were made alive. And by the way, it's not just at your salvation, because he goes on. Well, well, first of all, he emphasizes, by grace you have been saved. Right there he emphasizes, it was grace, it was grace, it was grace. It's only by grace that you have been saved. It was God's work. Verse 6, and raised us up with him, so that continues on this grace. He raises us up. He seats us with him in the heavenly place in Christ Jesus. For what purpose? So that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. This is quickly becoming one of my favorite verses. He saves us and he seats us with Christ so that in eternity he can show his immeasurable grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus grace that continues forever because it's immeasurable. It won't stop. Isn't that wonderful? That is our hope. That is our future. That is our inheritance. And in case you missed it, Paul says again in verse 8, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And some people stop there and say, oh, there we go. Through faith. I had to believe. Right? I had to believe. And this is not your own doing. And he's talking about that whole phrase there. Remember we talked about that, the neuter, the masculine, the feminine? He's talking about that phrase. The grace, the faith, this is not your doing. It's the gift of God. It's, it's not a result of works. Why? So that no one may boast. Because who's the only one who can boast about your salvation? God. I will boast in the Lord my God and I will boast in no other. You see, when we share our testimony and we tell people, I received Christ, I went forward, I said the sinner's prayer, and we, we talk about I did this. I'm sorry to say, but every time I've done that, I was kind of boasting in myself. Because it was about what I did. Is that what God saved me for so I could tell other people about what I did? He didn't save me for that. You say, see, you're being kind of harsh, Pastor. You're being picky. We're talking about the purpose for the grace of God here. And God gives us clearly his purpose. And his purpose is so that he might get the glory. So that he will get the glory. It's not a minor thing for me to rob him of his glory. I'm not, I just told you, I've done this a million times. I've said, you know, I accepted Jesus Christ. I've said those things. I've probably said them recently, but I've been convicted this week. No. God did it all. God did it all. God saved me. Unless you think, well, I'm not boasting when I say, you know, I received Christ. I want, I want you to think about something. Because when, when I say God did it all, some of you go, but what about my neighbor who's not saved? God hasn't given them this grace. Well, if they're still breathing, you don't have a clue whether God has appointed them for salvation, okay? You don't know. So your job is to share the hope that you have, right? Continue to do that. And don't stop, because you don't know. You don't know what's going on in their spirit. You don't know what's going on in their heart. You have no idea. So don't pronounce your judgment, okay? God knows. But let me spin that around. You ask about what, what about your neighbor. Let me ask you. If you say, but I believed, but I accepted, but I trusted, I ask you, what about your neighbor? Are you better than them? 
Because by you saying, I did something to get saved, you're saying, I'm better than my neighbor. They didn't believe. They rejected him. My friends, so did you. And so you would have continued to reject him if he did not give you his grace. You would have continued to reject him. You would not have received him. Because look again at verse 3. Among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. You would have continued to live your own desires. God in his grace had to interrupt your life. All glory is to him. All of it is to him. Every ounce of it is God's. Every ounce of it. There's nothing for me to say. How should I share my testimony then? Right? I mean, how, how, how do I say when I was saved? Well, when I was five years old, God saved me. The Holy Spirit came to me and he opened my eyes to the truth that I was a sinner. He opened my eyes to the fact that I was following after my own desires and I did not care about what God wanted. And the Holy Spirit, he gave me understanding to be able to understand the gospel, to understand the truth that Jesus Christ came to save people like me. And he placed that understanding in my mind and he opened my eyes and he made me alive so that I might believe because <laughs> I never would have. Look at the grace of God to save a wretch like me. That's our testimony. We brag on our great and gracious God. Amen? Why am I so belligerent if you want to use that word, or indignant that we must stick here. It's, well, one, because it's his purpose, right? But it impacts how you live your life as a Christian. It impacts every day of your life. This understanding of the grace of God. Because if I mix myself in there, then as I go to live my life for Christ, I start to think there's something of me there too. There's something of me there too, that, that I have some goodness that I've got to offer to my God now. And I become no longer practicing biblical Christianity in that thought because I still think I've got to bring something to God instead of recognizing, no, biblical Christianity is God brought something to us. Amen. And the Bible says that he, we love him, why? Because he first loved us. Why do I now obey Jesus Christ? Because he loves me so much. And I love him because he loved me. It's not out of a duty. It, it's not out of a, I, I hope that he's happy with me. He's already happy with you. I had somebody who missed church recently and they said, I hope God's not upset with me for missing church. <laughs> You're a Christian, right? Yeah. But he doesn't get upset with his kids. He sees you, he sees Jesus. He sees righteousness, he sees holiness, and he says, I'm pleased. Because when God's upset with you, you're under the wrath of God in verse three. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Do you see how this affects your every day? So why do I walk in a manner worthy of the calling? Because he loves me and I love him. Why do I put on humility? Because he loves me and I love him out of the love that he has for me. Our obedience 
is out of the grace that God has extended to us, out of the love he shows to us by his wonderful, awesome grace. Never, ever do we think this will make God happy with me. No. It's I want to display, express, and show the love that I have for him because of his great love for me. Do you see the difference there? That's biblical Christianity. That, that's why I don't stand up here and preach, you must do this. I tell you, I read, I read an article a couple weeks ago, and it was all about Christians must do better. Christians must do better. Christians must do better. You know what that is? That's the Pharisees saying, here's another law. Here's another rule. Here's another rule. And you go like this, I can't do it. And that's the point. You can't. That's why our complete dependence is on him and his grace. I need him every hour, don't I? I need that grace every moment because I can't do it. But Christ in me, he can do it, right? Grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Christ enables. Christ empowers. When we go to talk about spiritual giftedness, we have to start there. That it's Christ in me that causes any gift to flow through me. And, and, and we need to get that right first. Otherwise, we're gonna think wrongly about spiritual gifts, and that's why Paul starts with, but grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. And we will talk about spiritual gifts. And I'm looking forward to it. I hope you're looking forward to learning about spiritual giftedness in the church. Can I give you a sneak peek? I gave it to our class. Can I give you a little sneak peek today? You're gonna learn over the next few weeks that you are vital to the church. Some of you might come in on a Sunday morning, you think, I got nothing to offer these people. I don't even know what I'm doing here. I have no purpose here. My friend, if you are in Christ, you have an absolute purpose given to you by Christ himself. You are vital to Norton Baptist Church. You are vital. If I lost my thumb, maybe I could make it without it, but I'm going to sure be hampered by that, right? I want every one of you to leave today saying, I can't wait to come back and learn about how vital I am, how God has given me purpose in the church by his grace. His grace is so much more than salvation, isn't it? That's, that's just the beginning point. <laughs> it's so much greater than that. Grace so much greater than all of our sin. Let's pray. We could not thank you enough for your grace, Father, for the changes you have wrought in our lives. Father, for your Holy Spirit that indwells us, that seals us, that guarantees us. Father, we listed off over and over again all that you have done Father, help us to understand. Give us greater understanding. This has been transformative in my life. You know that. You continue to transform me by just teaching me simply what grace is and how desperate I was in needing it. Thank you. And Father, that seems so feeble, but you desire for us to say thank you. Father, we give you praise. We give you glory for the work that you're doing continually. We thank you so much that we have eternity with you for you to pour out your kindness on us then too. That your grace is immeasurable and it will never stop. Wow. Oh, Father, I just pray that you would give us a greater love for you as you have loved us. As we learn about your grace more and more that we might increase in love so that we stop obeying you out of duty and begin more and more to obey you with a heart of love for you. 
pray this all in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.